Okay, good afternoon. So uh, this session today, the rest of today, will be sort of in between scientific methods. It will be about data management and reproducibility. I will start with the first part, talk a little bit about issues of, of research data management, uh, and uh, also present some, some solutions that we at the, the G-Node, at the German Neuroinformatics Node, have, have developed. And then uh, uh, later, Michael Denker will uh, present or, and focus more about uh, reproducibility, data analysis workflows, and application of, of the different tools and, and methods. Uh, so uh, as a background uh, on, on, on why, why I'm, uh, we are talking about this and why um, this, this course, for example, is organized by the German Neuroinformatics Node, where there is something like a German Neuroinformatics Node, the G Node, uh, a little bit of a background. Uh, so Gnode is part uh, of the INCF network. Uh, so the INCF is the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, which is an international organization that uh, came out of the EO, uh, OECD uh, Open Science Forum that was held uh, in the early of uh, uh, late 90s, early early 2000s. And there were working groups on neuroinformatics w which recommended establishing an organization to coordinate uh, neuroinformatics globally. And this led to, the, to uh, the INCF being established in 2005. And INCF is a, is a globally acting organization, but it has a central, central uh, secretariat in Stockholm. Um, and uh, at the moment, 17 national nodes, that is, countries that have joined this organization. Germany was one of the uh, founding members of this organization. The idea being <coughs> that global efforts, globally coordinated efforts, uh, sh uh, w will be needed to, to develop neuroinformatics uh, because it doesn't make sense that every country with its funding agencies and so forth uh, is, is, is working you know, in isolation on on these on these um, on these methods, uh, science is a global effort essentially, and uh, and also the, the the development of tools and methods for science and standards should be done at a global scale. And and neuroscience was was seen as a as a uh, field very much in need of such global coordination. So this this basically is is is, is reflected in the mission of INCF as being a global independent coordinator coordinator of neuroinformatics developments. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, I, uh, Germany was, was a founding member and at the same time as the INCF was established, uh, the German government started a funding initiative, a very large funding initiative on computational neuroscience, which was called the National Network Computational Neuroscience. Now it's, it's, it's uh, known as the Bernstein Network. Uh, this is the result of, of, of 10 years of funding for computational neuroscience, and computational neuroscience is meant, you know, not just, uh, as it might seem, you know, just uh, uh, funding the th theorists who make models, but to specifically fund the exchange between experimentalists and theorists, because it was realized, of course, that, you know, uh, uh, progress in neuroscience is, is, is very much dependent on experimentalists and, and people who do models and who, 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 who do data analysis working together and joining forces. So this was one of the, uh, of the core goals of this, of this network and of this funding. And now we have uh, a, a fairly large net network with more than 200 research groups all over Germany. And we also have in, in this network uh, several um, uh, infrastructure facilities. And G-Node, the German Neuroinformatics Node, is one, one of these. It's, ho uh, it's hosted by by the LMU in Munich, uh, and uh, its goal is to develop solutions for uh, to to help the scientists uh, in, in data management to make the data exchange easier for 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 the scientists. Um, the Bernstein Network also has created the, the Bernstein Conference, which is an annual conference. Probably many of you have heard about it, maybe even have attended. Uh, it's uh, uh, meanwhile the largest European conference on computational neuroscience. So, so this is kind of the setting uh, of, of, of where we are in with, with the G-Node, kind of a link between this national network, this national Bernstein network, and the INCF uh, global uh, international community. 
So, what do we do? What is the what is what is our goal? Uh, the germinal was was specifically uh, uh, established to to target the issue of cellular and systems neurophysiology because there it was seen that this this field is so very complex and 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 there so many so it's such a large diversity of methods and 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 uh, and data structures and 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 uh, science questions um, that it's it's fairly hard for for uh, scientists to collaborate. Yeah, if you think of uh, an experimentalist and a, a, and a theorist, for example, who want to join in in uh, you know exchange, exchanging data and working on on models, uh, then it, it's very hard to to um, explain to the person who has not been involved in experiment, for example, what the data mean and how to read the data and how to analyze. Yeah. So so this was was one of the main targets because also the the, the number of groups working on, on neurophysiology. Is very large in the Bernstein network. So over the years, we've been we've been working on on uh, solutions at, at several levels. Uh, we've been cr uh, creating data conversion tools to make it easier for the scientists to read data in in different formats or to convert data from different for between different formats. Um, uh, we've created methods for data and metadata management to help the scientists in in, in the lab organize their 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 data and metadata. Uh, we, we provide data sharing services, uh, a platform where you know you've 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 you've, you've seen the, uh, the Gin uh, service. This is, is basically uh, uh, um, a, a replica of what we are we are running uh, where, where, um, at in Munich, where everyone can si can sign up and can share their data. Uh, we also provide custom solutions for data exchange, uh, and we're we're also uh, involved in teaching and training activities. So. And one of these teaching and training activities is where you are right now, the under uh, advanced neural data analysis course. We've also been running uh, a shorter course on neural data analysis, um, which was one uh, one really week long and which provided a low barrier entry uh, for for uh, sci neuroscientists, uh, PhD students, to start working on their code and start improving their 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 uh, data analysis. Um, um, in in a, in a kind of kind of uh, yeah easygoing way, but getting in touch with the with the code, sort of what what you are doing here as well, uh, but you are doing it uh, at a little bit of more advanced level. I will will since the course is longer and will involve different different uh, further exercises and tasks. Will of course go more in in depth. Uh, so these were our courses on data analysis that we provide. We're all, we've also been running for several years now uh, the advanced scientific programming in Python school, which is a, uh, a, a summer school that introduces um, young scientists to uh, uh, good scientific programming um, pra practices. Uh, so, so this is not a course for learning Python. It's a course for learning to code better in Python. Because you know more about you know what is what it's all about about the you know the the the, the background of the of, of 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 the language of computers as such so you can uh, uh, at the end write better code uh, write code that is better maintainable that can be shared so others can can use your code and so forth. Uh, th currently, so this year this will will be held uh, in September in Italy and the application period is currently open. So if you're interested, uh, please apply now. We're also running uh, at irregular intervals workshops and tutorials on data management. So um, let's go back uh, to the um, to the issue of, of research data management. This is what I want to talk a little bit more in depth now. Uh, one of the focus areas that we have at the G Node. Uh, so. The question is why? Why do we care about data management? I've kind of a little bit alluded to, but the question is why should you, as a scientist, as scientists, care about data management? Uh, so one reason might be because data, research data, is typically at the core of of science. Yeah. Uh, science depends on uh, being grounded in 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 data, and uh, in fact, you know. Um, we, we're typically focusing on, on publication as, as the output of science, but there, there are other kind of notions that even 
sort of degrade the publication, the scientific publication, to something which is just an advertisement for the actual science, for the scholarship. And what is the actual science? Well, it's it's in here in in this in this quote by. Uh, uh, quoting uh, or paraphrasing uh, John Clairbaut this is from, um, from a paper of Bukhide and Donohoe. Um, um, it says that the uh, it, it refers to a computational science to the, to, to the field of computational science, and there it says that the actual scholarship is the complete software developing an environment and a com complete set of instructions. So all all the code that went into a scientific result. Right? But you can see this also, or translate this easily into experimental science uh, when you add the, the data. Yeah? So, so what is the, the, you know, the, the, the substance of your science, the, 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 the scholarship? It's not the, the publication that comes out of it, but the entire data acquisition, uh, the experiment data acquisition, data analysis, including all the code that you use. Because this is something that in principle, other scientists should be should be able to to inspect and to see and and, and you know to see how did you get to your results? How to get, did you get to your conclusion? So this is this is kind of the uh, what, one one argument why why it it would be uh, um, useful or, or or important to to think about data management because it you you're supposed to be able to to have your data available. And this also refers to something that has been a uh, uh, topic of, 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 of uh, many talks uh, you know, in the past years, the so-called replication crisis or reproducibility crisis, uh, when it has been found that many studies, and it started with, with looking at psychological uh, papers from psychology, but, but um, this also uh, you know, applies to all other fields, and, and I'm sure also to neuroscience, that many many studies in uh, that are published are not really reproducible and and one problem with not being reproducible is that when you find that something or you have the suspicion that something is not reproducible you would like to go and back and check well, how did the the original scientists uh, how did they get to their to their results right and this requires having the data having the analysis code and so, so forth uh, all available available another reason why you may want to think about data management in your lab is because there are a lot of external either incentives or uh, external pressure that's coming up that's existing already to some degree but it's also coming up uh, so the funders keep requiring it um, they have been for several years so when you, uh, I don't know if, uh, how many of you already, you know, uh, 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 wrote, wrote a grant proposal, but your supervisors, when they write their grant proposal, typically they have to include, uh, you know, a, a few sentences about a data management plan for the project. This is so far something that is not really strictly, you know, checked or, or reviewed, um, typically, uh, but uh, the the since since the entire scientific landscape is starting to become more o more open. This will certainly be uh, more rigorously checked uh, in, in, in the future, and it's good to pre prepare for that. For example, the, the at the uh, EU EU level, the Horizon 2020 program, they started a couple of years ago with a so-called uh, open data pilot, with, where they were requiring or were encouraging the scientists who were who were uh, getting EU grants uh, to make their data open and provide a plan for how to, how they would do that. Yeah. And meanwhile, so over the uh, a couple of years, three four years, this changed now. First, it was kind of an opt-in thing that you when you wrote the grant, and it was not uh, explicitly stated. This will not affect you know the review of your grant. Yeah, you know you, this will this will be of your proposal. This will be completely on scientific basis. So uh, it was completely voluntary to say, okay, I want my want to make my 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 data o open after the study. Um, but now it's the other way around. Now it's an opt out. Now uh, it's 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 the default. Uh, uh, EU requires this as the default to provide a plan how to make your data open. And if you don't want, then you have to opt out. 
Yeah, so so things are turning. Things are getting more into a um, yeah notion or understanding that science should be open, and this is this is um, in fact the kind of the, the the core of science science that you know everything's open, everything's open for discussion. Uh, besides the funders, also there's several publishers now or several journals that require that you provide your data with uh, with a publication with the same kind of idea in, 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 in the back that when you have a publication, people should be able to go and, and, and check in more detail how you uh, arrived at the results that you're presenting. Uh, this at the moment typically is also not very heavily checked or reviewed, like if you if you um, maybe one of you has already uh, published a paper um, uh, where where it was required to provide also the data, I'm I'm pretty sure no none of you has has gotten any any um, comments from the reviewers about the data. They they are reviewing typically now they are typically reviewing the the, the paper, and nobody's looking at the at the data. But I'm I'm pretty sure this will also change in the, in the, in, the, in the coming years as you know, as the publishers also learn, you know how you know they also have to recruit basically reviewers for, for, for doing it, for looking at the data. Some journals have started at, um, kind of test trials to do that, uh, and and I think this is, in, is involving, and it will become more and more uh, mandatory basically to to not only provide some data, you know, something there, but also something that is accessible and readable by by other scientists. And so we're going into a, you know, a, a phase where, where we will see an increasing openness and this will, will also be reflected in the expectation of other scientists that come and say, oh, okay, where is your publication? Where are your data? Yeah, so we, sh we should prepare for that. And uh, the last point or the last argument uh, that might even be the best one is selfishness. Because I think it's in, in our own interest to have uh, a good data management in our lab because it saves us time. Yeah? There's, there's studies or I mean kind of informal studies, but it's, it, it's, it, it repet it's repetitively been quoted that scientists spend a lot of time uh, just what's called munging data, you know, meaning trying to find data, trying to, to read that data, even in their lab, yeah? in just, in, just in their lab, trying to, to, to uh, read that data, trying to read data of their of their students after they've left the lab. That's a typical situation. A yeah, student is, 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 is doing a PhD. Maybe the, the data are even, even published. Uh, and then the student leaves, of course. Uh, and maybe two years later, there's an interest in going back to this data. And it's, it's very hard for, for anyone in the lab to, to access the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it takes a lot of time. Yeah? Uh, so one, one estimate that is that, that it, scientists typically are uh, spending about 60% of their of their time when they work on scientific topics. 60% of that is 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 on 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 data munging. Yeah, not sure if this number is really correct, but it, it you know it is it is a substantial uh, part. I think everyone knows that from own experience. And the question is, wouldn't it be really nice to only spend half of that time and have the other time free for really thinking about the science? That should be the goal, and so I think I think this this is this should be the largest incentive for us to try to have a good organization of data and consistent organization of data in our lab, so that we you know make the li life easier for ourselves. So, why is it so hard? Why do do we have to spend so much time on on, on data munging? Uh, one reason, uh, at least in in, in in the neurosciences. Uh, is that we have were typically very complex experiments. We have compl complex uh, qu research questions. The data are complex, uh, and this 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 complexity alone makes it makes it hard to you know organize the data, to find data, to um, document data, and so forth. We are also often uh, very often relying on collaborations with others. Yeah, so we have to make sure that data is available and we have to ex uh, exchange um, the volume of the data that we are acquiring is, is, is increasing probably all of you are experiencing this you know uh, with all the new methods for for recording um, the volumes 
of data sets are increasing massively, which creates also a problem in data handling. Uh, so so all, all this together basically uh, contributes to this uh, situation that we, when we want to access our data, that we are, you know, data that we're not immediately working with, but we, but we created in the past or uh, generated in the past and want to go back to, it, that it typically takes an effort, time and effort. And having having a um, good data organization in lab benefits us. It reduces this effort, and so this, since this, when the effort is is reduced, it means we we can easily more easily get get to our data, we, which enhances the reproducibility because we can better understand what we what we've been doing, and it also facilitates the ability to share data with others. Share data with others or share data with ourselves. So that's that's again, you know, this, this situation when we when when we talk about data sharing, uh, it doesn't only mean we share with others, but we also share with ourselves. That's it. That's the most important the most important condition that we should try to to arrive at, and it starts in the lab. Yeah. So and typically in the lab, uh, we want to make sure all data is, is is recorded, all data is available, all the information is inf is uh, is recorded. Uh, there's a, typically in labs there's a, a lot of hidden knowledge that kind of everybody knows and kind of it's transferred from PhD student to PhD student. Uh, and it's also important if we want to be able to to uh, understand our data, say a few years in in the future. That we also document this, so uh, kind of get, trying to get into these these practices of the, of documenting all the information is really Im important. Yes. Well, hidden knowledge is kind of the knowledge that's in in the lab that is that is maybe verbally, you know, when when you s when a new stu PhD student comes in and he learns how to you know handle the setups and everything, how to do experiments. It's a lot of information that they you know they learn by being instructed, for example, but there's an, at, at no point is the information written down somewhere or, or provided with the final data set uh, so that, but it may be important, right? So we always, you know, uh, set the setting of this, uh, of this amplifier to this and this, which, 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 can, which will be important if for the data analysis afterwards to know what kind of filtering uh, uh, appeared. But this is often, because it's always the same, the setup is always the same, uh, it's not it's not documented. So this is what I mean with with hidden knowledge. So the next step after being after sharing with yourself is sharing with a collaborator where you have an interaction where you can provide a lot uh, of of uh, clarification. And you can answer questions and so forth. Um, and you you select specific data sets. And then the the the. the, the Yet next level is then sharing with the world, which is exactly the situation when you are done with your study. Basically, you have, you're publishing your paper, and then, then maybe you're you want or you're you're asked to provide the data with uh, uh, with, with your publication, or you you decide to do a data publication. So this is also a possibility now. Some journals uh, accept. Uh, a, or have have kind of an article um, uh, type which is called data publication, where you do not describe a new scientific finding, but you describe your data set in detail, make it available so for others to, to use it and to reuse it. Uh, so this, can, this, this is all then uh, the situation where you want to share with people you don't even know. You know someone else might, might take your data set, might, might reuse it. Uh, and here, it, 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 this is specifically challenging because there's no, there will be no interaction. So you want to make sure that the, the scientists who, who access your data, uh, that they have a chance to understand it. Because otherwise, uh, they might do things that with, with the data that are not appropriate. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and you also, you know, it should be in your interest to, to make the data re be readable at all. Uh, and uh, not have some, you know, artifact there, some some data there that some files uh, that nobody can understand and nobody will ever be able to reuse. So it's, uh, you have basically technically shared your data. Uh, it is there, but uh, uh, semantically nobody can make make sense of it. Mm -hmm. This is a situation we want to avoid. And the and then the the the, the, um, 
way to start, I think, is if we try to improve the situation here in the lab, in our lab. So, and this will benefit ourselves because it's easier for us to do our research, uh, but it also will make it easier for us to provide data in a form that is understandable for everyone else. And by the way, though we've already question, had questions. If there are more questions, just ask me anytime. Um, and regarding the situation of sharing with the world, again, uh, I want to uh, briefly introduce uh, this kind of notion or these, 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 these guidelines, which are called the, the FAIR principles, which some of you may have heard uh, about already. It's something that has been come up a few years ago and has taken up uh, a, a, a has been taken up by uh, you know a, a lot by by scientists and also by by providers and also by funders. Uh, the fair principles. Um, it's an it's an attempt to provide some some guidelines of how you can make data, uh, you know, better reusable at the end, which means first of all they need to be findable. Once they are found, they need to be accessible, meaning you know you can you can you have a way of of actually getting to the data. They need to be interoperable. That is, they they, they need to you know you have to have a chance to to use them to 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 work with them, and they have to be reusable. That is, they they have to you know legally be reusable, but also has have to be understandable. Uh, so 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 these guidelines. Um, are kind of thought as you know a course a course framework of how you should try to to or of a go of goals to to achieve. Um, primarily, I would say uh, this this was thought of the situation the situation uh, that was considered was that the data are there and how do we provide services that you know will will achieve that. But a lot of this depends on the actual data provision, the actual data that, that, that the scientists provide uh, that uh, are in a form that enables to achieve uh, all these, these criteria. For example, all the documentation, all the metadata, the information about the experiment, uh, how, how the data were acquired and so forth. This is all important um, to be able to, to reuse the data in the end. You know, uh, on the kind of more more gen general side, the recommendation is, for example, to make the data findable is to use uh, globally and persistent identifiers. Uh, you all probably know the DOI. This is a this is an identifier, a digital identifier, the uh, persistent identifier that is used to um, to indicate or to 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 identify resources. Uh, papers typically or data sets. Um, the idea or the, the, the goal would also be to use machine readable uh, descriptions of your, of your data in order to, to be able to, uh, of, of, of automated services to find your data and, and know what's in your data. Uh, accessibility means that it must be clear how the data can be accessed. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's fu uh, fully open, but there must be uh, a way of, of finding out how you can actually access the data. Interoperability, and this again uh, puts some demands on this on the scientists. Uh, what kind of formats do you use to to, to store your data, to provide your data in? You know? uh, what kind of terms do you use for for uh, annotating your data? And the reusability also, you know, has as this aspect of legal reusability that is um, licenses. You, know, you should you provide your, when you provide data, you should you should always have a license so that that uh, others know how to use how they can use your data. This is another another topic to consider. Uh, and we at the, at the Gino we pr we provide um, data publishing services, and there are also the users are and scientists who want to make a data set available, they are required to, to choose a license. And then we often get questions, oh, what, what license should I choose? Uh, what does it mean? What, what difference does it make? Uh, so 
the software developers, the uh, open source community, for example, they, they have a long you know, experience with licenses uh, and there's a lot of licenses for software uh, for, for research data. It's not so common. Um, and uh, we also well, have, have not so many licenses, uh, different licenses to, uh, that are uh, appropriate for, for research data. Uh, one very common set of licenses are the Creative Commons licenses. There's a website where you can, we can get information on those, uh, and they basically specify uh, different levels of, of, of reuse that you allow, or different conditions for reusing uh, your, your data. Uh, the, m the most you know, open one is the uh, public domain dedication, so this is strictly not a license, it's a basically a waiving of all rights that you have as the, as the author or the, the creator. You know? uh, so you basically are waiving your copyright and, and have everyone can do whatever they want with, with what you provide. Uh, then there's the uh, CCBY license, which requires that someone who is using your data uh, will give you credit. That is, they they um, uh, cite you or cite the, the source uh, where they where they got the data. Um, so um, this basically is a is a, is a way of getting credit for your for your data for your work. You don't have to to uh, just uh, dump it somewhere, you can always ask people who are making use of it that they also acknowledge you. And there's the, then different, different further, further um, constraints, basically, that you say, okay, uh, any, any work that, uh, that has been done with that, and if it's published, it must be published under the same conditions, or I don't want my, my, my data to be used in any commercial uh, application, or whatever. So there's different, different um, further constraints, as you see here, um, uh, for a start, uh, the CCBY uh, uh, license is typically this is the one that, that most scientists choose because it's it's very easy and it's it it, it also is very open. Yeah. So uh, an another thing I just wanted to mention here in this in uh, at this point where we're talking about you know more more general uh, general services and general issues in in data management. Uh, something to to look out for. This is something that's that, that's currently coming up. A, a funding program by the German government, who also have recognized that uh, improving the situation in data management is is really important. Uh, if we're interested in you know uh, making progress in in science and not only in neuroscience but in the entire you know over the entire scientific landscape. So this is a funding program. Um, to specifically uh, target uh, issues of uh, data management, um, uh, data provision, uh, standardization, and so forth, um, which which is which is intended to to create basically a, a, an expert network of you know uh, training training scientists uh, together with infrastructure providers uh, uh, to better work together and to. Uh, create better solutions for data management um, that kind of uh, connects, you know, all the all the all the um, pillars of the science system, the universities, the uh, research institutes, uh, IT centers, and so forth. Yes, yeah. The idea is not, of course, that this is not isolated in Germany, but they all and and, and all the 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 uh, um, groups that that come up with proposals, they must also make clear how they connect to international initiatives. Uh, this is, a, this is a, of course, a, a very important, uh, important requirement. Uh, so there's, there's also a lot of infrastructure at the European level. The o European Open Science Cloud just uh, was started officially, uh, providing a lot of services that most scientists don't even know about, uh, and, and they don't know how to use them. And the idea is, is really to, to um, work closely with the scientists, bring them together with, with, with uh, providers, service providers, uh, and also, of course, connect to uh, international and pro provide solutions that are interoperable with, uh, with, the, with international solutions, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, we're currently preparing a, uh, a pro proposal uh, for uh, a specific uh, neuroscience uh, research data infrastructure group 
that will of course interact with with all the relevant other other uh, groups here in 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 in, in this um, uh, in this program, but also uh, will will make sure that solutions that are developed here are uh, developed in coordination and in, in, in com compliance with international standards and uh, international solutions. So let's get back to the to the data management in the lab. Um, I wanted to make cle uh, clear that I think that that the, the 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 best way to start is to to start really in our own labs and try to improve the the situation for us. And what what is the situation? Well, the situation is, for example, you did an experiment a year ago and have worked on something else, and now you want to go go back to your experiments because maybe you read a paper that you know presented some result that might you know touch on what you did back then but in order to to be to compare that you need to find out what you know what was the exact sp stimulus parameters that you used yeah what kind of frequencies did you use question is how do you find out say this is a parameter that was not really the 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 most Im you know the, the the control parameter you used in your experiment for in your study but it was a kind of a side parameter did you ever did you even record it where where where, where could it be and there's lot lots of Places where this can be typically in a typical uh, experimental lab, right? Can could be in the source code of of a software that you used. Could be in a file that was written automatically. Could be part of a file name because uh, you have some convention of how you name your files. Uh, could be in your, uh, that you it's in your notes in the in your spreadsheet that you use, or in the notes that you write by hand, or somewhere, right? So, how do you find out? How do you is there is there a, uh, do you have a way to find out? Um, and how can you make sure that in the future all information that that is important or might be important uh, for a data set is available and stays available? This refers to the to the overall notion of metadata. Yeah. Besides the actually the data that you are recording from your recording equipment, there's a lot of meta, what we call metadata. Metadata means data about data. Yeah. So metadata are also data, and partly very important data because, for example, it's very impo important to know what what your stimuli were that you were uh, using when you're recording something. Um, and and there's a lot a lot of me metadata that that can be, in principle, can be um, recorded in a way so that it's persistent and that you, you are sure uh, you, you, can, uh, you can access it, uh, you know, even, even years from now. Yeah? So you have, the, the besides the recorded data, you need to know in order to, to understand the re your recorded data, which are typically just numbers on, you know, in, a, on, uh, in a file, in a binary file, you also need to know what, how to translate these numbers into the 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 scientific uh, quantity that you were recording was it a voltage was it a current yeah uh, so you need you need uh, conversion factors you need units uh, you need the sampling rates and so forth i mean these are these are very obvious you know otherwise you cannot do anything with with the data but um you know question is 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 it, is it always recorded yeah? then you have a lot of data that you know you could call hard metadata because it is data that you can you can record as you know data as say key value pairs where you say temperature was so and so many degrees yeah? and sampling rate was so and so many samples per second uh, and this could you could all you could all record uh, um, you know in 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 some electronic form some machinery to perform so you can you can have tools that make use of that and 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 make sure that it's all collected you can automate automate a lot of that um, and automa automation is is a way of ensuring that that it's there. Yeah. And then there's only a, a small part of the metadata, which is kind of very hard to really really put down uh, because it it requires explaining a lot. Like you know, why did you do the study? What was the question you were you were after? Right. This is typically what you what you then what you then provide in a publication. Yeah. Uh, but all these, all these kind of hard parameters, um, 
you could in principle save and you could store and you could uh, you could m make sure that they are available and, and and this is something if we if we try to do that we we will make our lives easier and the and the lives of our colleague colleague scientists so how how could we do that how do we do this well it's not of course something that you know just comes for free basically we have to work a little bit on it we have to 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 prepare ourselves right so we have to think about it uh, how 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 can we organize our metadata collection? We should try to to be clear, yeah, to to you know write down or record things unambiguously, so that when we we, we think of ourselves two years from now, would, if I would read this, if I would uh, you know read this this uh, the name for this parameter, would I know what it is? Would I understand it? Yeah? We should try to save all the information, even if it's something that we think now is not important, but in the future or for other purposes, for other reuses, it might be important. And probably the most hard thing is to be consistent, to store things uh, in the same way. Yeah. So the typical, the typical uh, situation that you may have seen in this, in this little cartoon here a few slides ago, um, by the way, these these uh, illustrations are done by Luba Seel, who is uh, uh, at the at the Forschungszentrum Mülich. She did this in, as part of her PhD thesis, um, and I use this with permission. She's uh, she's fine with uh, re reusing this. So that, for example, you have some some files about your uh, on, of your data set, and the naming conventions are different for each so each file, right? Or if every day after every experiment, you you make up some names. Uh, that's something that 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 at the, in the future will be very hard to to understand. Yeah. So so if we if we try to be consistent, to and and that requires thinking ahead. You know, even be before we start the experiment, think of how we are going to do that. That will go a long way already in 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 uh, ensuring that uh, the data becomes uh, or stays available for us, uh, accessible for us. So how 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 can we make this easier? This process planning ahead. You know, so, uh, just uh, just as much as we think about the experiment, the experimental question, you know, how do we design the task for the for the animal, for example, we should also think of how what are the the kind of data that we will acquire, what are the kind of metadata, and how how do we collect those, and how do we uh, do we store them? Uh, and then once once we have a good idea about that, automating things uh, again is is something that's very important because that, that at the end then saves us us time. Yeah, and we don't have to think even think about it anymore. That's that would be of course the ideal case. It also uh, avoids errors. Uh, so and uh, for automating, it's of course good if you kind of if you know how to write scripts yeah. in whatever whatever scripting language you you prefer. But if you you know. Uh, acquire some skills that that help you automating things uh, on your computer. Uh, that will that will be very really helpful. And then, you, of course, you can use tools, uh, and you should also use conventions that other other scientists use, um, and, and 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 use tools that are that are available to help this help doing this. And I would like to to. Yeah, so the situation you, you mentioned is really common that every lab has their conventions, uh, but the, the conventions are different between labs. That's a typ typical situation. And, you know, the question, is there an organization that is uh, taking care of that? Well, in principle, the INCF has, you know, one of, some of the goals of the INCF is to, to uh, promote, um, you know, common conventions and, 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 and standards. Uh, currently, they they have started now um, an activity where they identify uh, tools and and uh, best practices in the community and endorse them. Meaning that they you know they 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 are reviewed and then they, the the INCF says okay this is a this is an endorsed standard. Meaning you know it's good to to use them. Yeah, you can you can use them. You can you can rely on them. And and this will also lead you know scientists to to more and more and more use the same tools and uh, same conventions. Yeah. But it is a it is a real problem. I mean, it is a far way to go, uh, um, be just because the you know the, the space of, of of problems to solve with tools and and, and standards is, is is so large. 
uh, uh, but you know we're we're trying to make progress. So I'd I'd like to um, introduce a couple of uh, of, of tools and and uh, formats we've been working on in the past years, um, always with um, in mind having in mind how to improve that situation, the typical situation that we have the reco recorded data on one hand and we have a lot of metadata, a lot of information that uh, is acquired during an experiment uh, typically from different sources. You have tip typically different machines running, different computers running they, that, that all might produce metadata. You have some measure other measurement devices, you do some recordings by hand and so forth. Uh, so, so all all the different information are in, in different formats, uh, and and the question is how how and how do you bring them together? And you know, typically they are also remote from the data. Yeah, so you have the data in some files, and you have the metadata in other files. How do you relate them? How how w can you get to a situation where you link? Ideally, you would want to link the metadata to the to the recorded data, so that you are able to find data you know, based on the recording conditions, for example, or stimulation conditions and so forth. So how how could you do this? Well, we've been, over the years, we've been trying to, to come up with tools and solutions for, for these kinds of problems. The, 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 the challenges that we face, especially in neurophysiology, is that, yeah, the field is so diverse. We have a lot of uh, different um, techniques. We have a lot of different um, uh, methods. Um, we have a lot of different preparations, different different species are used, different different uh, experimental paradigms, uh, and so forth. Uh, different file formats. Yeah, every acqu data acquisition system produces uh, data in different different file format. Uh, there are no common standards um, uh, on, what, on, what, um, on what to to converge to, and that makes makes the situation uh, really hard. Um, so. Um, our approach a few years ago was to to start with uh, a well-defined data model for the actual data for the rec recorded data to have a representation that is that is ac accessible and understandable for scientists and to have very flexible methods for the data annotation because there there we have the large variety between the different uh, approaches different experiments every experiment creates basically a different different types of of, of, of metadata uh, and therefore, uh, data annotation methods must be flexible, must be adaptable to to the situation in the lab or in in, in, in a specific experiment. <coughs> and uh, then we try to come up with with solutions how to integrate the metadata with the met with the data, so that you can specifically link uh, 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 metadata with data, so you know you know what metadata belongs to 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 which records. So starting with the representation of, for the for the um, neurophysiology data, we were involved in the development of the of the Neo model, the Neo Python package. Many of you may ha have heard of it. It's a um, it's a, a package that defines uh, names, object names for electrophysiology data, which gives you the ability to um, represent whatever IFS data you, you have in the same form. Yeah, to 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 basically work in a common way wi with electrophysiology data, it uh, it defines or it objects for um, um, analog signals like voltage traces for spike trains, uh, uh, provides ways of, of of grouping them according to time and or space or electrode. Uh, so this is a, a, a very very useful way and and kind of minimal way, uh, but never the less achieving a common representation. Uh, it's 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 fairly popular. Uh, it uh, has been adopted by 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 many labs. Uh, is easy to adopt. Uh, it is Python, yes. But um, uh, so, but if you're working on Python, this is uh, this is basically the de facto standard for for representing electrophysiological data. Uh, another component of the Neo package is this set of I/O modules enabling to read a lot of different electrophysiology formats and this again gives the ability to whatever your recording system data acquisition acquisition system will produce the the, the the files you will be able to read them with with the new uh, 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 with the new modules and that makes that very versatile and very useful uh, 
as a way to, to represent the data, re the recorded data. Now we st still haven't touched the metadata yet, right? So we, are, we have a way here to, to represent the, the recorded data, but what about the metadata? The metadata, as I mentioned, they have to be the, they have, has to be a very flexible way and a very general way. So we, we developed a model, a very general uh, model for a format for, um, for recording metadata in, ter in, in terms of key value pairs. So you, all you need to provide basically is the, is the name of the, the, the property you want to wanna say, for example, um, sampling rate, and then you, you provide the, the value together with the unit. So the idea is that you have really a scientific representation uh, you you had no, don't have just a number, but you know what what it is, and you know you know exactly what the quantity, what the quantity is, and this 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 content, what what you want to to um, store here is is separate from from the format. So AutoML provides a format where you can you can organize these kinds of information, these kinds of key value pairs in a hierarchical way, in a hierarchy, so you can you can group them, which is a way to uh, get an organization that kind of reflects the, the, uh, the structure of the information you want to store. Uh, typically, you, you, would, you, you would group different items, different metadata items, say, for your recording equipment under one section and then for the stimulation on another section and so forth. So, and you're, you're really free to, uh, to organize that in a way that is, that, that is suitable for your experiment uh, but nevertheless, you will end up with a with a with a with a format or with a, with a file that is machine readable. Yeah, and can be can be used, uh, can be uh, read in by 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 your scripts or by 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 tools uh, to to process the metadata and to to uh, meaningfully uh, analyze. Hmm? So so this idea this is a, a, a um, kind of a fairly simple format. Um, and besides the besides this the, the format the, the file format the actual file format we're also providing terminologies well so so the idea is that you would you would put in everything that you know right and then at the time when when, when it gets known right and you can do you can do this with the, with the tools for this RML format uh, that you add at some po at some some place in in your in your metadata tree, it's a, it's a hierarch hierarchical tree, that you add further items there. So so you wouldn't you wouldn't have a dummy entry or anything, which could be misleading. Which uh, I think, if I get it right, is what you're referring to. But you would you would add it afterwards. Yeah. So this is this is something that can can be done dynamically, and the idea is also that. Uh, since the metadata is acquired in different formats, to have basically a common format where you can can merge all this all this information together in in, in a unified way. Well, th well, this well the, the format per se does not does not make any constraints like that. What 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 you can do and what some of the, the tools do is what what you described that you basically have a form and you're supposed to fill that out, right? Yeah, but then you have to make sure. So th this is at the tool level basically. Uh, then you need to make make sure that something like that doesn't happen. That someone fills out, out just something, in, you know, just to have to have it done, uh, you know, without it being necessarily be, being correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, um, besides the URL, uh, a way to to reference um, and this is also something I might mention here. A way to reference these kinds of tools um, is by this R so-called RRID. This is a, a fairly new initiative to um, provide persistent identifiers for resources, for digital resources that they are use, you are using in your science. Uh, like, like, for example, software tools, but also, I don't know, substances or whatever. Um, as a, there's already a huge database for, for, for those. And the idea is also that you would use these kinds of identifiers in your methods section so that then there can be automated services that 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 find literature based on on the 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 used methods for example and on the other hand the other way around uh, enable tracking the use of methods 
by by that by they are mentioning in the in the in the publications yeah and this is a way that is a, is a m much less ambiguous way of referring to something for machines much much less um, uh, ambiguous than having a description of what what you you were using so so i i would en encourage everyone who is writing a, a a paper and 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 to to go you know through the mes message action everything that you used check whether there's an rrid for it and then just enter it okay so so I said the, that the method is really flexible in terms of what you can store because you need to be able to adapt it to your specific experiment. Uh, but then also at the same time we want to have conventions. We want to you know use also what others are using. So we are we are also providing uh, terminologies that you can use. So the the, the format except the automatic format itself doesn't doesn't you know enforce any of that, but you know, if you're looking for a term for for how to 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 um, name some uh, some item you want to store, um, you can make a few use of these terminologies. And the other way around, if you if you are using specific terms uh, for your metadata, then you can also provide them, and we we will extend uh, the terminology. So the idea is to have kind of a community col collection of terms that are are used for certain for a certain metadata in neurophysiology. And as I mentioned, there are several tools. There's uh, the, the different libraries for different languages. We have a uh, visual editor where you can then, once you, once you have a, um, a file, for example, you want to make additional changes or addition, additions you can, uh, manually. So the idea behind AutoML is that a lot, of, a lot of metadata collection should happen automatically by scripts that collect the metadata uh, from the different sources and bring them in a common format but then you also want to to make some some edits manually then you can use a, a visual editor or you can a, a very nice uh, spreadsheet front end that turns the AutoML files into uh, an excel sheet basically where you can make make edits and then you can convert it back again to the AutoML file this was this was written by people at the Forschungszentrum Jülich uh, so how how w would that look if you want if you are interested in in kind of a uh, case study for using uh, AutoML to collect all these different sources of metadata in a, in a lab in a, in a, with a, in a monkey experiment uh i can refer you to this paper here by Lua Zeel. uh she's the one who did the the, ca the uh, cartoon illustrations and she's been um uh using AutoML to uh, collect the uh, uh, metadata in an experiment where uh, recordings were done from monkey visual and motor cortex while during a behavioral task. Um, and uh, you, you see here a schematic of the metadata, data and metadata flow uh, in, in this experiment. And you see that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, traces for different, different types or the different parts of the metadata. And at the end, they all need, should be collected together in order to enable meaningful uh, analysis. And it's described in this paper. It's described uh, some of some of the procedures and methods she has come up with to facilitate that. Um, what this then uh, provides is, uh, you know, not only uh, data sets which are annotated in the sense that you have all the relevant metadata. But also, it facilitates the the data analysis and then working with the data. For example, what they could do is uh, they could analyze just just the metadata. You don't have to go to the data to, uh, for to doing that to to understand. You know what? How far along are we in the in in, in the project? Basically, how many sessions did the, did the animal make? How many trials were were correct and so forth? And so so this is a um, uh, just a illustration of uh, basically, the statistics of performed sessions um, uh, or, or, or even trials. Yeah, so this is over a week here, different trials uh, with different conditions. So you get a very nice overview automatically. You can you can write write basically a script to, that does that based on the metadata that have been collected. So so this this helps you keep track of of what is going on and 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 how how far you are along with 
with the data collection, basically. So I, I presented you this uh, um, data model uh, of NEO for representing electrophysiology data. I presented you the, uh, uh, a uh, format for metadata collection. So how do we bring these together? You know, we've been thinking about this and uh, came up with a with a um, with a data format that enables storing data in in, in, in files in a way that you have a uh, data model for the data that is inspired by the by the neo data model, but you also have the other male metadata, and you can they can make meaningful links between them, uh, and so so this enables then having um, both metadata and data together, uh, and be a being able to to go from the metadata to the data or from the data to the metadata, and so for the data part here we we again we created a. a um, um, data model that is that is similar to the to the neo data in that it describes it describes uh, basically scientific data. You have an, an n-dimensional data array, and you have you have uh, information about the dimensionality, about the 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 units, about, about what kind of data it is, um, and you have also a, a way to to link between the data arrays, so you can you can establish relations between the data. Uh, this you can all all um, uh, specify in in this data format, which makes it makes it um, uh, um, format where the data are, are, are discoverable, are understandable, uh, and and where the the da the data structure basically in the format reflects the structure of of the of the experiment or of the uh, of the underlying um, of the underlying data. Um, the, the 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 format this uh, is, which is called Nix is uh, defined by an a da this uh, internal data model and an API, and the and it writes the data to a file which is in the HDF five format, which is also a common standard for for scientific data. So um, any tool that can read HDF five files can can be used to to uh, read data in in, in this Nix format. And we also provide different libraries for for different languages, Python, MATLAB, and so forth. So the benefits of having data and metadata in a, in a common format with meaningful links between them is that, for example, you can find out or you can find data, specific data traces that correspond to certain metadata. Yeah? So if you say, okay, I I want I want all the spike trains from a certain unit that I recorded from. Uh, under certain conditions, then you can uh, find out which of the the data arrays in your file correspond to that because you have the links between the data and the metadata. And you can also go the other way around. You can say, okay, if you uh, if you find a data trace that that looks interesting, what were the the experimental conditions for that? And this is something that only not only you can do when when you've created this data set, but also someone else can in principle do because the links are there and it's. Uh, uh, every con everyone can use it, so it 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 facilitates data sharing because uh, it it reduces the uh, information that has to be given in addition to the to the actual data um, in order to make the data reusable and un understandable. So here's an here's an example, um, which which uh, shows how you can make use of this different inf information that and you can you can store in the Nix file you can store not only the raw data of course you can store all the also the derived data um in this example here the the data where um uh, high density mia recordings uh, retinal preparation um where um spikes or electrical signals were recorded uh, on a MIA array and spikes were detected. So this was a study where uh, a, a spike sorting method was was developed. And so you have the the raw data, uh, the voltage data, and you also have this, the detected spikes. And then what you can do, for example, you can uh, pick out one channel with a, with a few lines of uh, of code. You can pick out one channel. You can you can plot the 
uh, the, the, the traces, the recorded traces. You can also plot the, de the detected spikes here with the time point and amplitude. And you can also uh, plot uh, in the same plot the, uh, the stimulus. Yeah, this was a, stim a stimulus, uh, a li a light stimulus when the li uh, stimulus went on and went off periodically. Uh, and, and you can do this with a few lines of code out because all the data are in, in the same common form and in the same, in the same file provided. Uh, for the next f uh, format, we also have several tools. We have, for example, we have this uh, data viewer, which makes use of the features of uh, of Nix that you have not only numbers uh, stored, but you have really scientific data. You have you have quantities, and so this this uh, data viewer can automatically make make a meaningful scientific plot with with uh, appropriate labels on the axis. Mm. And you can also, of course, browse the metadata and then and then find the find the corresponding data to certain metadata. So this is for for manual exploration of uh, of data sets. You can also use the Nix libraries in in software. Uh, for example, the the Relax data acquisition software um, is using the Nix libraries to write the data. So data and the metadata that this data acquisition system knows about are written together in a common format. So so this with this approach with the with the metadata format and the data format which are compat compatible yeah because uh, Nix uses this, this RML format we have a way to support and and and, and provide uh, data and metadata collection uh, in the lab basically from data acquisition to data sharing with uh, access from from many different uh, languages, and also make it make it easy to provide the data then, without much effort, without much further annotation effort, uh, at the point when you want uh, to share the data. So as a, as the last um, point, I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, another service we're we've been developing over the past years. Uh, the GIN service for uh, data collaboration and data sharing. You've already used it. The, you have you've used the local installation here. Uh, we are also running a, a, a server, an open uh, server in Munich, where people can use this uh, for data management, for data sharing. Um, the I idea is to provide uh, something that supports Data, data organization working with the data, uh, version control of data, and for that uh, it uses the system uses Git and Git Annex. Um, the, um, the 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 web interface, if you've seen it, is a, is a little bit inspired by by um, GitHub, uh, and in fact this uh, this is based on uh, on a, on a um, basically a, a, a GitHub. Uh, implementation, uh, an open source GitHub implementation, where we've added the uh, support for Git Annex in order to version control um, large files, which which are hard to to version uh, uh, with Git, which, which we then Git. Uh, it provides um, secure access and data sharing, so you can you can share your data um, with colleagues, for example, who are not in your lab. Um, but again, at the same time as you've seen, you can also have a local installation in the lab and just use it for, for your lab. And the idea, as I said, is to, to provide support for the data management along the entire life cycle, data, data, data life cycle, basically, from acquisition to, to publication. So. If you if you uh, use the system, you can you can start version control your data sets right from the beginning. Uh, typically, when you when you make an experiment, you get some you get the raw data, but then you start you start um, pre-processing, yeah, for example, spike spike sorting or whatever, uh, and this this creates new data, new data files, and you can keep track with that with that system with that gen system. You can keep track of how how your data set changes. You 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 keep track of uh, what file was was added when. Um, 
you can work together within the lab you can work together on on, on the data and you 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 keep track of who made which changes um you can you can uh, you will avoid data transfer because you're you're um transferring large size only if it's if it's necessary then if we go on to data analysis again you you want to work together on it uh, you want to keep track of who does what when um you can go back to to previous versions if you you know want to compare or if you find out something doesn't work in your data analysis doesn't work you can go back to the state like yesterday or or two days ago uh, and, uh, and 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 find out what is what is the difference um, all these kinds of things that you can do that, that the uh, software developers are used when they're using github or you probably many of you are also using github uh, all these things basically you can you can do with uh, uh, when you're managing your data with Jin, um, and you also have if you're using the the our public server you have a way to access your data from from outside the lab. You know, often it's difficult when you're at a conference or you're visiting some some another uh, in another lab. Then it's hard often hard to get to the data at home. Yeah, but you can you can uh, with the, with the Jin server you can. You can uh, you have an access point basically uh, through the web uh, from wherever you are. Um, you can again uh, give remote access to, to collaborators who are not in the lab and still keeping track of, of who makes changes. And then when it when it comes to publication, when you have the uh, data set, uh, there are your results, your final results, and you want to publish them. Um, you can you can easily make the data set available, make it public, and you can also get a DOI for persistent identification and, and then a citation of the data set. So uh, to summarize, um, the point I, uh, points I wanted to make is that um, efficient data management is something that we we all benefit ourselves. Uh, so, so it should be in our own interest to to have an efficient data management in the lab. Um, it helps us to keep track of what is going on, all all the data, metadata, all the analysis. Um, it it reduces the risk of of losing important information, so that the data set might become unreusable. Uh, and and for that, open and machine readable formats are very useful because they can help to automate. Uh, things and um, uh, also integration of or integrated uh, um, organization of data and metadata is very useful because uh, it it uh, provides the information of which metadata belong to which data. It helps uh, uh, in data analysis. It helps in in, in uh, achieving reproducibility and of course it also helps in sharing the data. And with that, I'm I'm at my end. I would like to thank the the developers of the Gnode who have contributed to these tools and, and, and methods that I've been been presenting. And I would also like to thank a lot of people who uh, over the years have contributed and have collaborated with us